Get your Bibles, let's go back to Romans 2 and pick up where we left off. Romans 2, good to see everybody here today. Hope that you've had a, a good uh, weekend so far. And uh, weather's been, I guess, nice if you like the sun and a little bit of heat, but uh, I guess we're kind of in a drought so at the same time. So hopefully you've been able to take advantage of the nice weather and uh, congratulations to Dave and Vicky again. Appreciate you guys so much, and uh, definitely uh, be uh, praying for you guys. So Romans chapter two, and we're going to pick up at verse number seventeen. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. I'm reading in the wrong chapter. Excuse me, I was chapter one. I read that. And realized we've already read that weeks ago. So here we are now, I'm in the right chapter. Chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and uh, approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou, art, um, that thou, that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, and a light to them of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hath the form of knowledge and the truth and the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, and teachest uh, thou not thyself, thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that uh, makest thy boast of the law, through the breaking of the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. So we're looking at no partiality, part two. And last week it was the law, this week it's part two, instruction. So there's no partiality with God. And we're learning and we're, we're hammering on, or Paul rather is hammering on the fact that God's not going to just, you know, excuse some things. That there's not partiality. That, that we all have sin. It may be more easily seen in some than others. But the rea reality is, is that we all have sin. And that sin's got to be dealt with. Because if we just keep putting it off, and we keep putting it off, and we keep putting it off. Uh, as R.G. Lee, famous preacher, once said, there will be a payday someday. Uh, there will be a payday someday if we put off the reality of sin. And just like with our health, um, if we put certain things off, there's going to be some major problems. I had a vitamin D deficiency. This is probably going back about five years ago now. I could have put that off and said, well, you know, I'll just get in the sun a little bit more, maybe, and I'll just rest. I had to take some vitamin D supplements to try to help with that deficiency, if I didn't do that, I could have opened myself up for some other health problems. Uh, I have sleep apnea. I've got a machine that helps me sleep better. I could have just put that off. Well, my blood pressure would have went up, which it was already high. Now my blood pressure is 120 over 75 most of the time, which is right where, where I want it to be. Uh, but if I had just put that off, I could have opened myself up to health risks. So we don't want to put off the idea of sin. And, and Paul is trying to say, look, don't put this off. You think you're okay, you're not okay. There was a famous book written in the 1960s called I'm Okay, You're Okay. Maybe you've heard of it, heard someone reference it. If I were going to ever write a book, I don't plan to write a book. I'm not that intelligent. I'm not that good at putting words together to write a book. But if I were going to write a book, I would write a book called I Am Not a Okay and You Are Not Okay. Instead of I'm Okay, You're Okay. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll continue on here in Romans 2, looking at no partiality, part 2, instruction. Generally, Father, Lord, I thank you for this time. That, uh, your word can be opened up, that we can learn from it. We can be encouraged by it. We, our heart can be stirred simply by your word being proclaimed. It can be enough to, to, to drive us to a place in our life where we need to be. Lord, I pray you use this time for your glory and your honor. Help me to say what you want said. Keep me from saying anything that you don't want said. And uh, help us to focus on you. Help us to uh, apply these truths in our lives, whether we're 
uh, somebody that's been saved for a long time or somebody that's just asking questions about what this is exactly all about, uh, uh, draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I came across a story about an old, older man who was wandering through a desert, and this man was looking for water. Imagine that, you're in a desert looking for water. He approached an old shack, and on the porch area, he found an old water pump. Next to the water pump, he saw a one-gallon jug of water, and there was a note on the jug that said, use all the water in this jug to prime the pump. The man's instincts said, to drink the water and not trust the pump or the instructions that were there on the jug. Nevertheless, he poured the water into the pump until an abundance of cool water came up that he was able to drink from. The Bible is much like the note on that water jug. Sometimes the instructions contained in the Bible don't always make sense to us, but they're always right. Uh, the Bible tells us that uh, Jesus is the only way to heaven. Why would God create only one way? I don't know why he would only create one way, but I know he created one way. I know that I'm not supposed to steal. I'm not supposed to take things that don't belong to me. Uh, that harms relationships. I know that that's the true. Why did, why, does, why did God see that that was so important to put there? Well, he wants to help us with relationships, but outside of that... I just know that that's what he wants me to do. That's how he wants me to be. I know I need to serve him. I know I need to give to him. Why? Because the word says so. I know I have eternal life this morning. Not because I'm a good person. Not because I'm trying to preach God's word. But because the word says so. Uh, if you uh, go and you uh, read in uh, uh, 1 John. So there's three things today I want to talk about with no partiality. Now Paul's talking about here this idea of instructing. And he's trying to instruct these people who, as we will see uh, a little more clearly as we move through the text again, that these people were trying to instruct others. And they were really just pulling people down along their way. But the first thing we, we notice here in our text, verses 17 and 18, tell us about the boasting of a religious person. The boasting of a religious person. Look at verse 17 with me. Behold, thou art called a Jew. Well, there's some people that like titles, don't they? There's some people that love titles. They love to have letters behind their name, in front of their name, maybe in the middle of their name somewhere. There's people that like titles. So he's already saying here how you've got this title of Jew. And not only that, it says here, And restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. So he's saying you're... You're taking your title, you're taking your law, and you're, you're boasting of God with this. In verse 18, And knowest His will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. So he's saying here, you, you guys like these things, you, you approve of them, and as we see here, that there's, there's a boasting that's made here. The boasting of a religious person. This is not a good thing here to be boasting at all, in any way, shape, or form. We see here about the boasting of the religious person, and it says here they boast of God in verse 17, but before that, he says, he's mentioning their title of as a Jew, and he's mentioning uh, how they're resting in the law. So, we see a couple of things here. We see the association. We see the association. They boasted because of the association. They had boasted of their heritage. What's interesting here. This was evident that they thought their heritage was so important that Jesus pointed out the father of that heritage and how the father of their heritage was looking to Jesus. In John chapter 8 and verse 56, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So Jesus tried to appeal to the heritage to use it to point people to him for a relationship. Uh, friends, the idea of a relationship with God, it's not your dad's Cadillac. It's not uh, 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 the idea of, well, my, my grandfather was a preacher or a Sunday school teacher. It has to be a decision you make. You have to have that relationship. And I know that that's a hard concept to wrap around because as a parent or a grandparent, we want what's best for our children. We, we don't want to see anyone go towards death and hell in a place of, of eternal uh, fire, in a place of eternal judgment in the lake of fire. We don't want to see all of that. But we have to just give them the word and, and demonstrate uh, uh, through our lifestyle with kindness and with grace 
and uh, uh, to point people to Jesus, that's all that we can do. We can't keep anyone from anything because heritage, as we see here in Scripture, the heritage does nothing. Heritage can be something that's helpful, but in reality it doesn't do anything with your relationship with God. It doesn't do anything for eternal life. And I'm not trying to say, you know, just bag on your heritage by any means. Hey, there's some things you can appreciate about your heritage. There's some things you can learn. But God doesn't look at your heritage and say, well, you've got the right lineage, so it's okay. The the only way we can have the right lineage is to call upon Christ for salvation and, and be born again into that family of God. That is the only lineage that can be helpful to us. That is the only association. There's. It's not about going to the right church. It's not about uh, uh, wearing the right clothes. It's, it's, it's not about all that. It's all about Jesus. It's, it's Him or nothing. It's Him plus nothing, minus nothing. If they couldn't get past that here. We see the works. We see the works. Now when you go back to Exodus 19, 5 and 6, this is what they meant here by resting in the law. When, when, when Paul's pointing out, these people are resting in the law. It says, now therefore, if ye will obey uh, my voice indeed and keep my covenant. And that's an interesting word. I want to stop there for a second. We have a lot of relationships in this world that are contractual relationships. They're not a covenant relationship. I would challenge you. I don't have time to do it because it will take up too much time. But I would challenge you. Go do a word study on the word covenant and then look up contract. You see a, 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 a wide uh, difference there between like a contract marriage and a covenant marriage or a contract friendship or a covenant friendship. Uh, uh, I would challenge you to try to live in a covenant marriage or live in a covenant friendship. But I've got to move on. He goes on to say here, Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all of the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou speak unto the children of Israel. Even though the Jews had clear teaching of the Mosaic law, they had circumcision, their arrogance and fruitlessness offset these advantages. They were given everything. You want to talk about privilege. They were given the law. God talked directly to these people. And yet there was arrogance. There was pride. There was disobedience that offset all of that. You know, today we, we have a, somewhat of a privilege. We, we've got a Bible. There are languages and there are nations that don't have a Bible. There are places where there's a Bible in their language. But their government, I don't want people to have a Bible. We can go to Walmart and buy a Bible. And I realize we can get Bible on our, on our phones, but I find it interesting. I go back to when this coronavirus all started. Going to Walmart, doesn't look like the Bible section had been disturbed, and yet toilet paper shelves empty. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5. Jesus says, Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eyes. So Jesus is saying... We're walking around with two by fours out of our eyes and and hitting people. Basically, we're hurting people if we haven't uh, taken care of things ourselves. And the Jewish people here, they Paul's saying you haven't taken care of things yourself. And it's no different for us today. If we walk around with the attitude that we've sort of got things all figured out. And uh, and we just think we're here to correct everybody's theology. We're just here to straighten out everybody. I'm here to proclaim God's word, but it is not really my job to straighten you out. It's my job to proclaim the truth here. It's my job to tell you what this says. But when you go outside those doors, actually not even at that point, when I say amen, and we have the invitation time, you can do what you want with, with what was said today. I think Dave, the other day when we ended a service, actually referenced this passage, which is spot on with what's going on here. That, uh, uh, that uh, Jesus is saying, you know what, you're, you've, you've got what you think is a, a little issue, but it's really a big issue, and it's hurting other people. And yet, your, low, your, your issue that's hurting other people, really, there's just a speck in your brother's eye. That's not to say that we don't try to talk about truth, and we don't just, because if, if everybody was like, well, I've just got this beam out of my eye, and, and I just need to just not say anything to anybody, that's not the case. 
at all. What the, what the idea here is, is that we understand we have sins. When I've talked about homosexuality and, and have preached against that, I don't preach against it as somebody that doesn't have sins. The difference is I'm not calling my sin good. The people that are into that relationship, the people that are walking around with the pride signs, they're calling that good. We should not be calling that good. I cannot call that good. At the same time, I've got my own sins that I do not call good. I do not say that it's okay for the things that are sinful. So we see here a boasting of a religious person. The boasting of a religious person. Secondly, we see the belief system or the belief of a religious person. We see the belief of a religious person. Look at verse 19. He says here, And art confident that thou thyself art a guide to the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. And verse 20, An instructor of the foolish. You see the, the path he's taking these people down? You're an instructor to the blind or, or a guide to the blind? You're, a, you're, you're being an a, a, a instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes? which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. There was a kid, well I call him a kid, he's not really a kid now. At the time that he wrote this book I'm referencing, he was in his early 20s, and I didn't agree with everything in the book, but there's a young man named Jefferson Bethke, I think is how you pronounce his name. And he, he wrote this, he said, The problem with fear-based Christianity is we only obey when fear is present. Love, however produces lasting joy. So these religious people setting up the law, obeying, being obedient, it wasn't about, well, I want some good consequences and I'm trusting that God has my best interest in mind as I'm obeying. It was all about fear. It was, it was, it was a fear-based system when they were trying to guide people to following it the way they were. Religion can be fueled by fear and punishment. Jesus is fueled by love and mercy. Religion alone can use fear and punishment as primary motivators. In other words, you better do all the right things or God's wrath is waiting for you. Come to Jesus or you will burn in hell for forever, which is true. However, it shouldn't just end there. It's that, that, that should not just be the sole Preaching, it should be that God loves you. God desires the best for you. God desires a relationship with you. It's not about our performance. Religion paints God as an angry, spiteful cynic who sits around with his angels just waiting for someone to mess up and judge them harshly. We know that that's not true of Jesus. He isn't waiting to just judge somebody harshly. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to talk to him. He wants to interact with you. So with this belief of a religious person, we see here about them being a guide to the blind. Jesus addressed this in Luke 6, verse 39. And he spake a parable unto them. How can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? So Jesus addressed this and he said, look, you're trying to lead the people that are blind. And in reality, you're blind. You're, you're, you cannot be a blind person to the things spiritually that I have uh, uh, put in my words. You cannot be uh, blind spiritually and lead the blind and go in a good direction. Jesus said the blind leads the blind spiritually. They just both fall into a ditch. They don't go anywhere. A light to those in darkness. A corrector of the foolish. A teacher of babes. You could also say here, it's not just to talk about a teacher of Babes like, like, you know, a little baby. He's talking about teaching of people that are immature and not just teaching them because people that are immature need to be taught. But he's saying here you're teaching people that are immature and you're helping them continue in their immaturity. You're, you're, you're teaching them when he says here that you're a, a, a teacher of babes, they're, they're staying in that predicament in other words here. He doesn't say you're teaching and instructing people to grow. He's saying you're a teacher of babes. You're teaching, here's your fruit here, they're babes, they're staying in that uh, uh, mode they're at in life. And then having the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Ultimately, Titus chapter uh, 1 and verse 16 says, They that profess they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. What was 
further required to live by the law. This is where the Jews failed. Paul knew all these things about how the Jews viewed themselves because he himself was a Jew. He was part of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the, the religious leaders. Deuteronomy 27 and verse 16 tells us this about the law. And how, this is how serious the law was viewed. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. You're cursed. Being cursed isn't a good thing, is it? No one wants to be cursed. No one wants to hear that. Basically, our attention needs to be focused on a person and not a system. It needs to be focused on a person and not a system. We come here to church because a lot of reasons, but ultimately we want to worship Jesus. We want to sing songs that, that remind us of, of what He's done for us. Listen, when, when, when we're going down the road in a, in a car and, and you hear a song, maybe you heard on the radio when you were in high school or you were a kid, those songs stir memories of, of good times you had during a summer or, or somewhere with your friends. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if we're going to go down the car with some jingle in our, in our head, reminding us of good times, in the same way we need to come to church, whether we have a piano player or not, whether we have good music or not, we need to do the best we can to sing songs that remind us about how good God is and what Jesus did for us. Because I can guarantee you, I know there's songs that we all know that are secular, they're not in and of themselves necessarily sinful, but we could sit there and hum right along or sing right along in the car or on the radio. People do it all the time. I see people in town do it. I look over, they're bobbing their head around, and they're, I, I just hear them going, they're singing along with some song. I don't know what it is. It's probably something I wouldn't like, but that's okay. But, but people will do that, but won't, won't come to church and sing. I'm not saying us here because we're doing the best we can. I'm just saying our, our society as a whole, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't know how many times I've invited people to church, whether it's here, whether it's other places I've been, and here's the response I get. I don't need church. Okay, but you're missing out on, on an opportunity for God to speak to you. You're missing out on an opportunity to hear from His Word. James chapter 1 and verse 27, I've read this passage a few times. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. John Gill, who's a Bible commentator, he's been dead for a long time, maybe a hundred years. Listen to what he says about religion here. He says, religion itself is not pure and undefiled. I'll say that again. Religion itself is not pure and undefiled. That sounds like something people say today. And listen, the word religion isn't wrong, but here's, here's what, the, what his emphasis is. In James it says pure religion. Religion that's pure. It, it, the, the, the devotion, that word religion is, just, is really a, a word that speaks of, of outward devotion. That it must be pure. How is that, that outward devotion pure? Because it's focused on a person. It's not focused on a system. It's not focused on just check boxes and things we check off. It's easy to interpret that in strictly moral terms, a command, that in moral terms, this is a command to not sin. But it also means to keep ourselves unstained from the world's ways. Speaking of keeping ourselves unspotted from the world here in James 1.27. We must learn how to identify and resist the false worldviews that are dominant in our moment in time. This is why another reason we need to be in church. We need to learn the word. We need to be reminded of truth. Um, you're not going to get truth going to uh, the news. I mean, you, you might get some truth, but I'm talking about truth about developing a worldview, how you should view things around you, because we need to learn the, what's inside of this book. We need to learn <coughs> excuse me, the truth of this book so well, so well that when things happen, that this is like a filter that filters out things in our, in our culture and in our society. You need to learn God's Word so well that you could read a book and you filter it through God's Word. And you filter it in such a way where there's some things you can take away that are good and there's some things that's like, no, I don't think so because it did not pass through the filter of God's Word in your life. Matthew Henry said that it is custom of the Jews to take a great deal of pains in teaching their children. 
and all their lessons were out of the law. It were well if Christians were as industrious to teach their children out of the gospel. So they focus so much on the law here, they would teach that to their kids. Matthew Henry's saying, look, we need to take the gospel and teach it to the best of our ability. We need to take the gospel and make it understandable. We need to take the gospel and get it into people's lives. Not the law, not a system. It's a person. And then we see lastly here the blunder of a religious person. We've seen boasting. We've seen some beliefs. Now we see the blunder excuse me, of a religious person. Look at verse 21 with me. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? That sounds kind of hypocritical to me, doesn't it to you? Saying you're teaching others, but you're not teaching yourself. You're not learning anything. That that, uh, thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Paul's asking these questions not because he's looking for an answer. He's not saying these things because he's like, well, I kind of wonder. Paul knows the truth about these people. This is very similar to when Jesus would ask questions. Paul knew the culture. Paul probably knew these people on an individual level here that he's talking to and talking about. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through the breaking of the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. We see a blunder of a religious person. This is a a complete blunder that we're reading. As these religious men were telling everyone how wrong they were, they were merely deceiving themselves and others because they were just as guilty as the persons they were trying to convert. They were busy uh, practicing all they were preaching against. There was only one word for this kind of attitude, which is hypocrisy. We need to watch out for people who are always telling others how right they are and how everyone ought to be like them. I want you to be like Christ. I don't want you to be like Josh Hall. Josh Hall's got some problems. I want you to be like Jesus. I want to point you to Him. I don't need people to dress like me. I don't need people to act like me. Unless you're you know, acting Christ-like and then we happen to just be acting the same because we're pursuing Christ-likeness. The world doesn't need that. The world needs you to put on Jesus Christ. The world needs you to love others the way Jesus loves others. The world needs you to demonstrate and, and, and flesh out grace and flesh out mercy. The world needs you to help other people to do right. And when I mean helping other people to do right, I don't mean pointing out their faults. I'm saying giving them encouragement, giving them instruction, uh, letting, letting, them, letting them know that you're on their side. You want to see them do right. Oftentimes, these people, they are guilty of the very things they despise in others. Sometimes the sin is not external but lies in the heart. Jesus made it plain and clear that sin in the heart is just as evil as sin in the flesh. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery in his heart. You know what a Pharisee is? It's not just somebody in black robes. We can be, if we're not careful, I'm talking to myself here, if we're not careful, we can be a Pharisee. You may say, well, I'm not any type of religious leader. No, but the Pharisees were hard on everyone else and easy on themselves. We need to watch out for that. Another interesting verse is in 1 John 3.15, which says, if there's any hatred in your heart towards one another, we may not be saved. And if we are, we're not following. We went through that a few years ago, First, Second, Third John, that we may not be saved. And if we are saved, we may not be, listen to me carefully, we may not be holding to the relationship we need to with Jesus. I'm not saying you don't get frustrated with people. That's not hate. I get frustrated with people. You should get frustrated when, when people are doing wrong. You should get frustrated. There's a righteous anger, but hate and anger are not the same things. I can be angry at somebody, but not hate them. People I know have gotten angry with me and not hated me. They've just been angry with me. There's a difference. Because of the way 
or because they lived the way they did, excuse me, while claiming to be God's people, they were guilty of blasphemy. By their false profession, they destroyed the credibility of God. Listen here carefully to some passages that talked about what these people were supposed to be doing. Because we talked about them being teachers, guiders. They were supposed to be doing those things. They were supposed to be teaching. They were supposed to be guiding. Uh, Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16 says, In every, in, in this, excuse me, in every very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared to yourselves. No, he says to all nations. As far back as Exodus, Exodus 9, early on in that book, these people were supposed to be like missionaries. They were supposed to be on mission. And Psalm 41, 47 verse 1 says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. They were supposed to de- make a declaration. They were supposed to proclaim the truth. Psalm 64 and verse 9, And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. Instead of glorifying God among the Gentiles, the Jews were dishonoring God. And Paul quoted Isaiah 52 and verse 5 when he said this. Listen to Isaiah 52 and verse 5. We're almost done. Now therefore, what I have here saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught, that they rule over them to make them uh, to howl, saith the Lord. And my name continually, every day, is blasphemed. The pagan Gentiles had daily contact with the Jews, both in business and other activities. They were not fueled, they were not fooled excuse me, by the Jews' proclamation of devotion to the law. The very law that the Jews claimed to obey only indicted them. Warren Worsby says, Paul made it clear that it was not the possession of the law, but the practice of that law that mattered. In closing... There was a school teacher who had lost her savings in a in a business scheme, Ponzi scheme you could call it, that had been elaborately explained by the swindler. When her investment disappeared and her dream was shattered, she went to the Better Business Bureau. Why on earth didn't you come to us first, the official said. Didn't you know about the Better Business Bureau? Oh yes, the lady said. I've always known about you, but I didn't come because I was afraid you'd tell me not to do it. The folly of human nature is that even though we know where the answers lie, which is God's word, we don't always turn there to see what it says. We need to be going to the book. We need to be doing what we can to not just know it, but we need to live it out. And not live it out out of fear. Live it out because we know that this is good. This is what God desires for us. It's not about him being mad. God, God loves each and every one of us today. God loves you. God loves me. God loves the, the, the person that, that's uh, uh, within uh, arm's reach, you could say, or with, within just a short distance from here that could be the weakest sinner you could ever know. God loves that person. They've just not received that love. And today I hope that you've received that love. I hope that you've taken that into your life And I hope that you've made that not just something you know, but you've made it part of who you are. Because that's the whole idea here. It's not just the people that are following the law. They just followed the law out of fear and out of trembling. It It didn't change them. It doesn't make them a better person. Let's pray.